So, dear guests, if you're wondering why I switch to English, this is why we will have international guests on our next panel. And there we will take a closer look at the international view on autonomous and connected mobility, especially on the regulatory framework that is needed to reach the next level of intelligent mobility. So we discussed this further with the context of the German law, but now we will have a more international view on this from blueprints to regular operations, an international view on autonomous and connected mobility. This is the title of our panel and this is what we will discuss now. And I am very happy to welcome the following experts. So welcome to Richard Damm, who is the president of the Kraftfahrt Bundesamt or the Federal Motor Transport Authority in Germany. And he is also chairman of the UNEC Working Party on autom Automated, Autonomous and Connected Vehicles in Geneva. Hi, great to have you here. Then, yeah, thank you, pleasure. Uh, we also welcome Yasmin Fash. She is COO and co-founder of Gogo Network. And uh, this is a startup um, which focuses on autonomous vehicle mo mobility. And it is working on developing the legal and engineering framework of the European Autonomous Mobility Network of the next decades. And she founded it roughly one year ago. So a warm welcome to you, Yasmin. Then we have uh, Dr. Patrick Patrick Ayat, who is the global leader mobility and transportation of Hugen Lovells International. And Patrick advises numerous players in the mobility market on a wide range of legal issues with a current focus on autonomous and connected mo mobility. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Per Olof Arnes, who is the senior logistics strategist from Einreit. Einreit. And Einreit is the first company in the world who to test an electric and autonomous driving truck on public roads, and it's called the POT. Welcome, great to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so from, from, from blueprints to regular operations, this is the title. And uh, I would like to ask you um, to give us an overview. Where do we stand? So. Um, Let's start with you, Patrick, because I think you have a broad overview and you advise a lot of um, players in the market. So how much blueprint do we have at the moment and how much regular operations? Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, we have these vehicles on the road for testing purposes for many years now and, and basically everywhere. Uh, I think the, the, the big question and the next step is serial deployment. And uh, a couple of years ago, we thought we would be, you know, many years away from, from a regulatory framework, but I think we are getting there. We are getting there thanks to the work on the UN level. And I think uh, Richard can, can tell us more about that as well. Uh, and the German level, of course, um, we were just talking or you were just talking about the new L4 law in Germany. But we also have significant progress, I think, on the EU level, which is particularly important for us here in the EU with the ADS draft, which is currently on the table. And, you know, if things go well, we might have a regulatory framework also in Europe um, next year or so. We have something uh, in Germany, we have something in France and some other countries uh, that uh, went ahead, basically. Uh, so I think the regulatory framework is now catching up and um, zero deployment from a regulatory perspective is something that uh, will come very soon. Okay. Um, you already addressed uh, Richard, so I would like to ask him as well. So how much, um, how much reg regular operations are then, how much blueprint? So what is your point of view there? Yeah, thank you, first of all, for uh, yeah, allowing me to, to speak here uh, during the Bitcoin Mobility event. So I think it's it's uh, the point uh, Patrick already mentioned. There are many yeah activities on the way around the world, and you've mentioned the European market. I think France and and Germany are going uh, ahead. And this is not to protect the market, but this is just to accelerate the whole process on a European level. And uh, w our intention is to really take a, a lead in the in the global market with in terms of automation and in terms of of connectivity and this needs of course some some courage in drafting regulations you've uh, yeah addressed the point of uh, yeah the balance between regulations and the flexibility that is needed and that's what we're trying to achieve at the moment allowing the deployment a fast deployment but a safe deployment of the technology that's uh, most urgent but this cannot be achieved by yeah 
drafting only strict regulations. So we need to give flexibility, and this can be only done on, on an European stage and uh, global stage. Thank mm. you. Pay your nodding. So is there enough uh, flexibility for your business model? Is there enough flexibility that you can test your pot on the street uh, at the moment? Um, no. <laughs> we are testing. We are working with the Swedish authorities at the moment and also the US authorities where we are also uh, want to run tests very soon. But what we see is that the legislative and, and the regulatory process and the process of, of creating new policies is actually belonging more to the last century than the coming one. Uh, it's more of a descriptive. We have to describe every case and find all the corner cases before we can at least allow one test. And we think that we, we need to take a more risk-based approach to, to and put demands on us as, as uh, innovators to say that, okay, can you solve this risk situation? Can, can your technology solve that you don't have a driver in the vehicle, for instance? The driver will be a few miles away sitting by a remote station. Um, if we can convince the authorities that that can be solved with a reasonable degree of safety, then we should be able to try it. But um, the approach that is so common today is that you create the regulatory framework and then we have to adapt to that. And the regulatory framework today implicitly implies that there is a driver in each vehicle, even if the vehicle is autonomous. And we don't, have a, we don't even have a driver cabin in our vehicles. So f for us, we always need to seek exemptions and, and find these, these creative paths through. So we, we need a little bit more of entrepreneurship when it comes to policy creation. Mm -hmm. that, that's our main message. Yes, I mean, you are, are working on uh, the legal framework and also in the engineering framework. So your aim is to, to develop a frame, framework which oh, is more I, flexible. Maybe, I'm sorry to, to, I'm sorry who introduced Gogo -Go, and I just want to clarify. Yeah, like, yeah. We, are, we are like operating autonomous vehicles and in parallel because as um, you know, my colleague here just mentioned there is so much work to be done. We are yeah. contributing to the co-creation with government at the EU level and at the country level. But our objective is never to be the creator of this. We're just suggesting a couple of, uh, you know, thoughts as part of like, let's say, brainstorming between people that are a bit more on the ground. But uh, 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 we're operating like autonomous uh uh, delivery robots for packages and cargo. We have a partnership on, you know, autonomous shuttles as well with another transport authority. And I think to to this point, the, the, it's very hard, you know, I think it's a chicken and egg. We cannot just expect regulators to do it from their tower there and then, uh, you know, that it would magically solve all our issues and we cannot just complain and say they would, you know, so I think we need to work together. So that's why we're, we're doing this. Um, and I think we should also distinguish two things in terms of regulation. There's one thing which is the technical regulation. So what are all the safety standards? What are all like, you know, the critical elements that make, you know, your vehicle safe in a specific area? But what also we're trying to work on and explain to the government that, you know, there's also like commercial regulation that needs to happen if we don't want to basically only have the opportunity to do small pilots that have zero business model forever. Um, and then to just, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if there is no commercial framework, it's going to be like, you know, the jungle where like the most advanced uh, players from different uh, uh, horizon. And honestly, unfortunately, in Europe, we are not leading uh, as Waymo and so on in other, because we didn't have so much investment and it's understanding how can you create a, also legal framework that, you know, empowers also European champions and give them like a market where they could develop a business model at scale and attract investment and so on, because that's what's happening also for us in Europe. We haven't have been able to attract so much uh, investment in, the, in, uh, in this space compared to like what's happening in the US or in Asia. Hmm. Thanks for uh, clarification. I think it was a little bit lost in uh, translation there. So, of course, you're operating, but I think you're um, also interested in a regulatory framework, which is uh, beneficial for your business model, but also for, for the whole case. So uh, thanks again for clarification there. Um, so I would like, uh, given timing, I would like to talk about um, 
the, the point European solutions versus national solutions because we already talked about the German uh, level um, level four rule. We talked about that there are also efforts in Luxembourg, in, uh, in the Netherlands, for example. Mm, and um, of course, there's also the need for harmonization. And um, I would like to understand a little bit better what the importance is of international um, or at least European um, harmonization and uh, where, is it, where is it beneficial to have some national rules. So where do we have to distinct between them and um, what party can do um, what better at that? So maybe uh, I think you have all the opinion for this, but maybe Patrick, if you would like to start, I'm very interesting in your opinion there. Yeah, I mean, um, and it is a bit complex because there are several layers. There's, of course, the UN level, and we have the UN conventions, G Geneva and Vienna, and there needed to be some changes here as well. And there's still a lot of work going on, and I guess Richard uh, can can talk about this as well. But then, particularly when we talk about Europe, we have a European legal framework for for the uh, you know registration. Uh, or approval of cars actually, and then registration is done locally. So we need the type approval framework um, that needs to be there for those vehicles to be on the market. And I think, um, and everyone agrees, we need a flexible approach here. Uh, we need something, and we just issued a white paper on the road to autonomous vehicles, which also advocates uh, a flexible approach uh, because there can be so many players that come into the market and we have some players here uh, uh, in this round, which is also why I think we should be careful in regulating the commercial side, to be honest, because there is competition out there and this will work it out. The, the most important point at the moment to get the technology on the streets is, is the safety of these vehicles and the assumption of regulatory responsibility. And whoever... Uh, assumes uh, the regulatory responsibility and this can also prove a safety concept which will then be reviewed by the authorities by in germany for example kba together with the technical service uh, should be able to bring these vehicles on the market and for this we need the regulatory framework and it can be the automotive manufacturer who are currently i think struggling with the semiconductor crisis and also electrification but it could also be a supplier um, who is working in that area or the new entrants. And we have uh, one at least here with a pretty impressive truck. I mean, I, I just recommend everyone to, to have a look at this pretty impress impressive truck, which probably, and I wanted to make that point, Per Olof, uh, scares a little bit the regulators if they see that. Um, but so I can understand what you said. It's not just a normal vehicle. Um, it's pretty impressive and advanced. And, and I think we need to allow everyone um, to, to uh, you know, assume this responsibility and get their products on the market. Um, uh, yeah, and maybe I'll pause here and let others to, to, to add. Yes, I would agree to this. So, uh, Yasmin, I see you were nodding, but feel free to, to answer this, uh, to this, to add something um, to the question uh, uh, why we need yeah. harmonization and where it, is uh, where it is possible and where it is needful. No, but I think it goes back to the same point at the end of the day, when you look uh, at development of the space in all the region of the world, what, you know, what is a bit scary and depressing about Europe is that like it's at the local level of a city, right? And you have like, uh, I mean, you have local regulation on top of everything. And when you're like trying to do a pilot on experimentation, it's like every city is different, every, you know, and it's kind of like the resources that are required uh, to actually, you know, launch something you realize, like you realize that what what would help us as operators is to have like um markets that make sense right that have a certain scale like uh, like it's like if you talk in the past to a telecom operator that you know put antenna everywhere and then suddenly has a network in a whole country and you say no you're just going to do first like this area and put your antenna there and then this area and each time bid for a license to operate like uh it's i think if you don't, if we are not able to get some scale, it's going to be very hard to create, uh, to, to really get to transformation and bring the product to market because it will only be like sprinkling innovation and like showcases, but never real use case that actually are solving the way people move or the way packages move. Um, and the work is getting more global, so we have to, to adapt to that. Hmm. Uh, you said you need market that makes sense, and I think that's a very, very good picture at the end. Um, uh, Richard, so you are operating in uh, both. So you're working for the um, Federal Motor Transport Authority, but also for the UNECE. Um, so how do you ensure and what are your efforts to create these markets that make sense to, to phrase Jasmine there? 
Yeah, so first of all, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm chairing the Automated, Autonomous and Connected Driving Working Group uh, at uh, the UNEC, the WP29. The WP29 is the World Forum for the Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. So what we are dealing is uh, harmonization, a global harmonization of such regulations. And I think it's, it's of utmost important to do it at a very early stage. And that's what we are trying. I think we are all facing the, the same challenges in the different countries around the world uh, with regard to automation and uh, and connectivity. And I, I think it is key that we are trying to address some, some basic requirements and define basic provisions. For example, what is an ODD, for example, what are functional safety elements and how is such a safety assessed? Because, um, yeah, if you, if you go to the US or to Europe or to Asia, I think, it, you have to have such definition that you need for uh, the implementation of a technology. And, and that's very important that we have the same definition. We are now starting on the point, does a, an autonomous vehicle need some light signaling devices for other road users, for example? And it's, of course, in Germany, we would, we would call it a super GAU. So a, a very worst case, if you would have a, I just say, blue flashing light in the US and a green light in China and a, a white one or a red one in, in Europe. So that's what we are trying to address. Very basic findings at this stage. I think we are not at the point to regulate it fully, but to draft guidelines that we try to yeah, publish next year so that uh, the different regions and countries around the world can make use of such uh, basic definitions and basic requirements. And just uh, two last sentences regarding Per Olof. I think we had a similar situation in Germany about the testing areas where you had to go to the city, to the local authorities to get the approval. And that's what we are trying to centralize at KBA to get from a central point an approval and you can test in, in the whole country of Germany, the different products you would like to test. You just have to prove the safety concept for your vehicle. And that's the new approach we are taking. Thank you very much. And that's really good. I want to say that's like uh, Europe should look at that and like implement that approach in all the other countries because that's just alleviate a huge burden and makes, you know, just the operations much more streamlined. So this was a little bit of advertising for um, driving tests in, in Germany, Per Olaf. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. you just announced that uh, you also started testing in the US. So what was your reason to, to uh, go for this location um, instead of, for example, going uh, to Germany? I, I mean, we go where our customers are and we have, we have global customers. So we now are rolling out with General Electric appliances in the US and, and they were first there but but going back to to um, looking at the international level and w we would like to put faith in the UNEC at Enride because we think we need international sort of basic guidelines that will take care of all the boilerplates and, and that will be needed but what what concerns us is that the these type of actors that I represent that are building uh, the future now, and we are moving very much faster than the OEMs and the incumbent industry, we have not been invited to the table to give our views. Uh, most of the companies that, that are asked are the incumbents and the, the industry that preferably would think that we are, should move a bit slower so that they can keep up. And uh, I mean, we are five years old and, and two years ago, we were first on the planet to go on public roads autonomously with the freight vehicle, heavy freight vehicle in Sweden. Uh, for us, six months is a very long time. So please ask us, we, we want to be able to be responsible and take responsibility for, for our future direction because we are working both with autonomy, but also electrification. Both of these need to take um, take the lead together. The worst case is when we automate diesel vehicles, because then we will lower the operating cost for diesel, and then we will have even more carbon footprint from the transportation sector than the seven to eight percent that we have today. So, so um, uh, and if you ask the OEMs, I'm not sure you will get that answer. You will probably get other. Um, things that they see more important. So we, we would like a seat at the table, companies like us. Okay. Um, 
Is it something that you also experience, Patrick, because you advise a lot of uh, different parties there? So is it something that uh, the two points I think Per Olaf uh, made, that um, the speed is some kind of too fast uh, for the regulations, but also that they that they are not the right parties who are invited to the table to set up a, a good framework? Yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, the, the automotive industry is so established with established players um, and, and there are new entrants coming in now for years. It's not just uh, for the last one or two years. I mean, so this changes the game. And yes, we can see that there may be difficulties for a new entrant um, to, to be on the table when these uh, laws are discussed or drafted or regulations. Um, there are consultations, uh, stakeholder consultations, for example. I think uh, the UK is, is quite good at it, I have to say, because through the Law Commission, they allow um, stakeholders to contribute and they take that very seriously. Um, uh, but, it, but there are ways to get involved. I mean, get in touch uh, with the regulators if, if you think that you have a point, uh, if you have a business model, if you want to test something. There are, I mean, you know, we work very uh, on a regular basis with also as, as lawyers, with the regulators, with the authorities. And we question them, you know, what whatever things and we get a response. So it, it is possible to get engaged, uh, to get engaged, engaged with, with the regulators and authorities on that. Uh, but of course it's it's more difficult and, and Richard will certainly add to this. This is very good. Um, And yeah, and, and I mean, you know, innovation always um, calls for flexibility. And, and I think this is important and also for speed. Um, we are getting there, but maybe not quick enough as uh, Per Olaf and other players, new players would like to, I understand. Mm -hmm. Richard, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you very quickly. So um, I, I think I was not advertising for Einright to come to Germany, but it's quite clear. Just te testing in Sweden or just testing in, in, in Germany or just testing in France or somewhere else in, in Europe is not sufficient. You need to, to collect the experience uh, of testing in different countries because countries are different. So the way of driving is different, the infrastructure is different. So the more, the more information you have, the better it is to develop a safe uh, technology. Coming to the contribution to the national, European and uh, international activities, um, I think from a national point of view, and I can only speak for Germany now, it's quite clear that we are doing our hearings when we are publishing a law and, and companies have the chance to contribute and also directly contact uh, the, the government, the different uh, yeah, ministries in uh, yeah, mentioning what, what the needs are and so on. On the European level, we have the so-called Motor Vehicle Working Group, the MVWG, And it is open for public. So if uh, delegations, if con companies would like to contribute to the discussion, it's possible. And on an international level at the UNEC, it's also open. It's, it's a public meeting. So you just have to register at the uh, UNEC as, as a non-governmental uh, organization. And then it has to be decided whether you get a guest status or whether you can participate as part of a delegation of an association. So I can only... Yeah, uh, make a, 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 the point that, that you are able to participate and, and you're very much welcome because we need the input. Thank you. We will. Okay, so the invitation is uh, uh, Olaf will take uh, Per Olaf will take it. Uh, Yasmin, what do you think? So is uh, this enough to have this this invitation and to know okay you can be part of it, or do you think there are other uh, things we should uh, in Foston which sh should um, be more more precise and more fast in, um, or we should enable other players to play a bigger role in uh, setting up new regulations like startups and like new mobility players. Yeah, so I, I think uh, Patrick summed it up, but I think there is something about like being proactive and being reactive in the regula in regulation and, and in Europe a lot of time. And I, I see Richard is saying that we need to do it faster and I appreciate that. But I feel like compared to the US, when they always regulate a posteriori and they just let more, uh, we always want, because also like it's our like more European way of thinking, we want to make sure, you know, everything is so through and structured and, And I think we need to understand that, like, if we continue with this mental construct, we are at the risk of losing another huge industry for Europe. We've been losing almost, let's say, and I don't want to be like pessimistic, but we do a bit like the internet revolution, the big tech player are not like European. We've been losing like, you know, the retail with Amazon still not European. And now we've always been champion in mobility, right, in Europe. 
And now this is a moment where we can be totally disrupted and lose this industry if we're not able to move fast and create the incentive and the legal framework for this industry to prosper and to grow fast in Europe, but also to make sure that um, companies like Einride, GoGo and so on can also play a role in this in this, in this this space. Because like, if you go to China, I can tell you that the government is really focused on this industry and has all, it is really focused on promoting their you know, their champions. So I'm not talking about protectionism, but we just need to be also smart about how we want Europe to continue to be a leader in this industry on top of being able to actually offer the service to users. I think there are two questions here that need two different set of regulation. And for sure, like, we need to be part of the conversation. OEMs need to be part of the conversation. Startups need to be part of the conversation. A telecom operator needs to be part of the conversation. Public transport operator needs to be part of it. And we need to, and it's the hard part of this, is that, I don't know, I think maybe in Iran is the same, but we are part like, of, I don't know how many working groups, like we cannot even count the number of working groups that are like asking for input, but it's so fragmented that even that is right now not working I would say in the optimal format. And I'm, I'm not, I mean, it's easy to say the problems. It's harder to find the solution, but I think it's clear is that they need to be at the top level of like country and, and European level of willingness to crack this problem fast and to realize that like uh, we are very good at regulating monopoly a posteriori. But like if we don't do anything, we can have, you know, just one player that will come one day that will fit all the technical standard and will just wipe up the market like Amazon did, like Google did, and so on, just because they have been able to just have much more investment from 10 years ago, right? As you said, Enron is five years ago. I think Wayne has been working this for 12 years, and you cannot compare the level of technology. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's for me. <laughs> But just okay. can I just add? I mean, I, I think we we need we really need all players. Um, we also need the big ones. Um, and yeah, we need uh, them too. Totally, we need. But we need to share the the like what we need is not to be wiped out. Because when you no. look at France, for instance, and we are so proud to have like you know Easy Mile and Navia that have raised each like, I don't know 30 million, 40 million. And when you look at how, what does those giants are spending, it's like they're jokes. It's like a, what they're spending per month, uh, and they've been spending that for. You know, and they are like operating in many states in the U.S., collecting data, learning, and so on. And here, every time you want to do a small deployment, it's like uh, you know, six months process. And as you know, as we just we don't, like we don't have six months, and we don't have infinite resources because also it's it's, I mean, it's a you know, at the end of the day, it's like the more complex it is for us to try and operate, uh, we lose money and. Uh, and um, and the harder it is already for European to attract investment because they see that like any way to scale things it's so complicated. So you don't you know like it's like a lose lose setup for European startup. If I can explain my if I don't know if it was clear the message, but like you will never attract like the biggest investor if they don't see a path to like a profitability business model like scale deployment not just uh, pilot. And for us also it's like. Well, it's hard to keep the focus and the energy and so on if we have to sprinkle our like effort, uh, you know, uh, and, and just multiply it every time we go to a new city. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, just, just to add, at the end of the day, it is important to, to get the best solutions on the market, the best technology um, and competition. I, I truly believe or strongly believe that competition will work it out. You know, you need to have the best offerings uh, for the market. You need to have a cool product. You you need to have a you know technology technologically most advanced product, and then you'll be successful. Um, it's maybe not that easy, but it's not easy for everyone at the moment when we talk about this. No, but Patrick, I'm so pro competition, and I'm pro different players for different uh, for the users. But what you see is that right now, it's. We haven't been able to compete in the internet space. We haven't not been able to compete in the retail space. And if we continue like that, we won't be able to compete in the, because it's not just mobility, like it's a new level of data and so on. And like to do that, you need huge capital investment. And all the startups that we have right now, if you just sum all the investment that they've been able to deploy in this space, and we've done the analysis, you don't even get to like, you know, the shoe of like the big players. And so, yes, you can say, look, I don't care. We just get like the biggest players. So just, you just accept that also Europe is going to lose this market. 
So, Patrick, I would like to give you the opportunity just to, to, to answer, but then, uh, given timing, no, no, I would like fine, to... that's fine, that's fine. I'll okay. just leave it as is. Okay, and I, I have to admit, I like it I if uh, the discussion spice well. up a bit. Um, uh, I just uh, have a look uh, at the at the clock, and I see we only have five minutes left, but um, I really enjoy that we uh, that you're interacting and discussing, because I think that's important to, to find a good framework and to discuss things and to disagree and to agree. So, uh, I like this very much, but given timing, I would like uh, to make a close Round um, and I would uh, so we talked a little bit about um, the uh, regulatory framework. We talked uh, talked about flexibility. We um, talked about um, security and uh, yeah the uh, the in between. And um, I would ask all of you, uh, starting with um, let's say Per Olaf, then uh, Patrick, then Yasmin, and then Richard. Uh, I would like to ask you if we meet again at uh, let's say uh, the mobility conference in five years. So um, what needs to be done until then? What has to be done so that you would say, okay, um, we can call it a success. The, regular, the international regulatory framework is successful and um, maybe also that Per uh, Olaf don't, uh, won't go to the yes, but he will do the next tests uh, in Europe. And uh, I would be very happy if you could give me a short answer because we only have three minutes left and Per Olaf, now it's up to you. Yes, me until The most important parts, uh, we, Europe needs to be able to compete with Asia and the US, and we are not able to do that now. All the, found, uh, all the foundational technologies are found there. The experts are found there. Uh, so, so we are a little bit strange, our company, that we have grown up in Sweden. But l looking forward, and what would be a true challenge, and I think what's needed, is we need to rewrite the legislations uh, for the next century. We need to look at electricity first and autonomy first. Um, if I want to transport dangerous goods with an autonomous vehicle today, and I'm talking a can of hairspray, there is no case available to do that without the driver in the vehicle. There, it doesn't even exist. So if you want to change that, it will be at least a five-year bureaucratic process. It's a nightmare. We need to do Control-Alt-Delete on the legislations and look towards the future, not patch the old stuff. That's, that's my main message. Very clear. We'll help you with that. Yeah. Thank you. Patrick, what do you think? What needs to be done that we can call it a success in the next five years? Yeah, well, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think we will have that in five years, that's the good. regulatory framework um, on the international and European level. And, and I, 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 I assume Richard is working on this very hard to achieve it, and we're trying to contribute as well. Um, and yeah, and, and I also strongly believe in, in corporations and partnerships um, and, and uh, also alliances um, when it comes to, to these developments. Uh, one example is the Catena X, which was actually an initiative in Germany, uh, pushed, I think, even by the government uh, to, to regulate or to find some you know, um, cooperation on, on the data sharing side when it comes to the automotive network, uh, all the major players and the national players, and now also it goes uh, beyond Germany, are part of this uh, Catena X network. And I think this is exactly the kind of collaboration and cooperation and alliance that we need uh, to, to make that happen. So, uh, you know, my point is really to bring all stakeholders together, the, the small ones, the big ones, the national ones, the, the European ones, and even the Chinese and US ones. All right, Yasmin, what is, uh, what is your point there? When would you say regulatory, uh, there is a regulatory success? I mean, for me, regulatory is really a means to an end. So I think uh, having the regulation and so on, uh, uh, for me, the success would be that if in f we look at in five years and we have, you know, out of, I don't know, the top 10 mobility players in the world, we have at least three, three that are Europeans. That would be a success for me and that, and that we have been able to, uh, you know, also have a real service to users and not just, uh, you know, a great framework uh, that I know that we can do. We are very good in Europe at doing regulation. That's like, you know, uh, but now we need to make sure like actually we are doing the regulation in a way, not just to ensure safety, but to ensure commercial success and making sure we keep a strong leadership in this sector in the world. Um, and I agree with the out delete. I think the autonomous mobility is a totally different industry. So you cannot just try to amend all the, you know, transportation act that we have in Europe because you're like touching suddenly we're creating, it's a new industry. 
that is like at the that's why there's no ministry of autonomous driving and when you're trying you know to to always think about those law with the government it's always between innovation transportation telecom and it's like going all around and i think that's really the the proof that we need to think from scratch again okay and then uh, the closing statement to richard so um What would you say, when is it a success if we do this work from scratch now and looking back five years uh, in the future? When could you lay back and say, wow, that was a good one and I'm, I'm happy <laughs> yeah, now? <laughs> yeah, that's a big statement to, to lay back. No, uh, um, I, I think it, I, it would be good if, if we would see from the policy side uh, the courage for the next years to allow the deployment of the technology. So to give opportunities to the stakeholders here around the table and uh, in the audience, of course, and to, to see the deployment in, in a safe manner. I think that's important. So and that's only possible, not only with regulations, but giving manufacturers a certain responsibility as well. And that's why we need the dialogue. It's, it's not as we did it in the past, drafting a regulation, we are checking it and then it's done and uh, product comes on the market. So it's like a, a relationship of the, the product, the manufacturer and the regulator over the lifetime of the vehicle. And that's, that would be an achievement if we could follow this way during the next years right. on national and international level. I saw a lot of nodding, and I think that's also that's always a good uh, good uh, sign that the the statement was uh, a good one for the the final statement. So thank you a lot for the lively discussion. I wish we had more time because uh, it was really really interesting to to know more about your views. So your views on the international uh, views and regulation on autonomous and connected mobility. So thank you for being here, Richard Damm from the Kraftfahrt Bundesamt, Jasmin Fasch from Gogo Network, Per Olaf Arnes from Einride, and Dr. Patrick Ayat from Hugen Lovells International. Thanks for being part of the Mobility Conference and for the discussion. Thanks. Thanks for having us.